Well, you've heard a little bit about where Pastor Rod's at, and uh, I just want to mention as part of, part of this that uh, we are all so blessed to have the leaders that have come before us um, to set a good example for us. And uh, Pastor Rod, his diligence in daily study and prayer is such a good example for every one of us here. And uh, Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we ask that you prepare our hearts to receive from you, even when the message is difficult. And so, Father, we ask that you, you minister to our hearts today. Help us in a spirit of love to receive well the things that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, some, some brief notes before we begin. We're going to be in the book of James, chapter 2, today. And uh, there are four men named James mentioned in the New Testament, and it's pretty much agreed by most scholars that the author of this book is the half-brother of Jesus, a younger sibling via Mary and Joseph. And um, he did not believe um, God's testimony of his son Jesus until the resurrection in A.D. 30. Um, the details of Jesus' family members and the reception of the gospel in Nazareth can be found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 through 58. For those of you taking notes, um, that's a, a good spot. So James begins chapter 1 very humbly, and he describes himself as a bondservant, a slave of God and of Jesus. And secondly, we see right away that the letter is dressed, addressed to Jewish believers who had uh, broken free of the law. The book is intended as a how-to manual for the Christian life, and not just for those early converts, but to all of us. James is gonna cover many topics, um, starting with trusting in the Lord, and especially in a heavy trial. He also covers prejudices, improper speech, judging one another, leaving God out of our plans, bitterness, and many other important areas of Christian living. However, the main theological issue that James brings to bear is what we will be covering today in chapter two, verses 14 through 26. And that is the issue of good works and their place in a Christian's life. The main controversy comes from folks who wanna argue that good works are a method of salvation. To the contrary, it's very clear that James has addressed this to believers from the very beginning of the letter in chapter 1 and verse 3, and it's repeated again in chapter 2, verse 1, and also starting in our section here in verse 14 where he uses the word brethren. Um, so let us turn now to chapter 2 of the book of James and begin. So starting in verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, 
So faith without works is dead also. Clearly, James does not allow us to get comfortable as we study God's word. The Lord calls us to much more than just head knowledge and memorization of his word. As, uh, as mentioned in the introduction, the book of James is full of practical examples of living out our faith, and today we're going to cover the brass tacks of why this is an essential part of solid Christian doctrine. As we've read in this morning's verses, it's quite clear that with true faith, our behavior must match our beliefs. Um, with that as our starting point, we move into the heavy theological topic of faith without works versus faith alone. There has been much debate over the centuries between theologians over the book of James. Um, at one point, there was even a possibility that it wouldn't be included in the canon of Scripture because of these particular verses in chapter 2. So to get some background on why uh, this is a potential issue, let's briefly review the foundational doctrines we have from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, please turn back in your Bibles a little bit to the book of Ephesians. So we're not going to read the entire chapter, but we're going to read a good portion of it. So Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses. Thank you, Sean, for keeping up with me on the slides. Um, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So verses 4 and 7 are full of important information. Whenever we see but God, it's the start of critical details that are coming our way. Um, and quite clearly, God has raised us up and saved us because he's rich in mercy, because of his great love for us. Sorry, this is another slide here. Do you mind, Sean? Uh, yeah. <laughs> because he's rich in mercy, because of his great love for us, because of the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us, all of which comes to us through his son, Jesus the Messiah. Paul cannot speak of this glorious work that God does without reminding us that it is a gift of grace given to the undeserving. We're not saved by our faith, though it's important to note that faith itself is not a work, but rather by grace through faith. So, surely, some of us will ask, isn't faith also a gift of God? And yes, this is true in one sense, because he gives us the ability to have faith through his grace and mercy. But the grace or power to believe as compared to the act of believing are two different things. Let me say that again. The grace or power to believe as compared to the act of believing are two different things. Without the grace or power to believe, no man ever did or can believe. But with that power, the act of faith is a man's own. 
or a woman's own. God never believes for any man or woman in the same way that God doesn't repent for man or woman. These are decisions that we have to make ourselves. Therefore, the person who repents is enabled to choose to do so or not. And that is through God's grace and mercy that he allows us to make that choice. And God is never forcing any of us to do that. Okay, we continue now with verses 8 and 9 in Ephesians 2. Here Paul continues, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now if we stop there, we get some very solid doctrine that we are saved by faith alone and that we bring absolutely nothing to the table. It is 100% a gift from God that we don't deserve. And there's nothing for us to be proud of in the act of salvation either. Um, The context here is really the important thing. Paul was talking to Pharisees and Judaizers and he was making clear to them that works on their own had zero value. Um, in, a sen- in essence, any works pre-salvation are worthless. It's an important detail, and that's why it's, it's highlighted up there. Um, and we may run into these things, you know, when you talk to someone who doesn't necessarily believe in Jesus but thinks they're going to heaven because they do good stuff. Um, this is... This is the thing when it comes to that. And then we come to verse 10 in Ephesians 2. And this serves to reconcile the Apostle Paul's teachings with James's second chapter. So in verse 10 we see, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, works must accompany true faith. And we have been foreordained, as we see from verse 10, to do them. What Paul and James are both saying is that post-salvation works are necessary. To build on this unity of purpose even further, we can review in Acts chapter 15, which recounts the council at Jerusalem where Paul and James are in full agreement. And James publicly declares this as well. Um, He even authors the letter from the council to support Paul's teachings and uh, that gets sent along with some of the brothers uh, up to Antioch. So it should be clear at this point that James is not giving us a formula by which we get saved if we follow it. Instead, James is laying out for us a picture of what real salvation should look like Before we go through our verses in detail, I'd like to give you a little additional scripture from the book of Titus. So Titus chapter 2 says in verses 11 through 14, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that we might, he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That's what it's supposed to look like, right? So let us be zealous for good works and charge ahead into James chapter 2. If you could flip back to where we were. So we're going to take this in in pieces, verses 14 through 16. Um, I'll reread. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Um, the, the NIV translates what does it profit to what good is it um, 
I think it's helpful for us to understand the motivation for faith and the good works that come out of extension. Galatians 5, 6 says that faith worketh by love in the King James Version, meaning that it works by or through acts of love. So therefore, if a believer tells you that they love you, and yet they never do anything to meet your needs or help you when you're in trouble, is that real love? The fact of the matter is that it's not love at all. It's a fake love that is just words. Um, Faith can be faked as well. Jesus illustrates this truth for us in Matthew 25. Um, Verses 31 through 40 are the good part, which is known, and this is the, known as the judgment of the sheep and goats. And, um, well, first we'll read this and then I'll have a word or two. Um, reading from verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. These are the sheep, the ones with true faith. Um, the verses that come afterwards uh, in 41 through 46 are, are the goats, those with the artificial or fake faith. Now, our brother Grant just talked about a bunch of things here during announcements, opportunities for us to do these very things that we just read about. I mean, remarkable. I didn't plan any of that. It just came the way it did. Um, that's... Uh, That's strong guidance for us. And as we heard from Galatians 5, 6, it works through acts of love, our faith, our true faith. So, okay, we continue on to verses 17 and 18. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works, Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So in other words, a faith without action isn't real. The Christian faith should have noticeable evidence accompanying it. If you can't see a difference between a non-believer's life and someone who claims to be a Christian, there's, there's a big, big problem. to put a fine point on it. If I act exactly the same as a non-believer at work, that's a problem. The point, the point truly is, if our faith is real, people should be able to see our faith working itself out in our lives. A changed life shouldn't be private. Our faith shouldn't be private. There should be a difference in our lives after salvation. There should be good fruit and a changing in our priorities. What does that look like? So, in our lives, my wife and I, our vacations changed from going to Cancun to have a good time and to lay on the beach and drink tequila to a mission trip. Um, 
those are the kinds of things that change. You know, there's uh, the way that all of us spend our free time shifts from doing things to entertain ourselves to doing things that serve and bless others. Chuck Swindoll has an interesting way of illustrating this point. He says, faith is like calories. You can't see them, but you can see the results of them. (laughs) I have been working on that particular physical issue. (laughs) Um, But it is true. You know, the, uh, the results of faith are obvious to the observer. So continuing on verse 19, you know, James pulls no punches here and says, even the demons believe and tremble. So that means even the the devil and his demons have more real faith and they're at least affected by that faith. Um, The great preacher Charles Spurgeon said, if there be a faith, and there is, which leaves a man just what he was, and permits him to indulge in sin, it is the faith of devils. Perhaps not so good as that, for the devils believe and tremble, whereas these hypocrites profess to believe and yet dare to defy God and seem to have no fear of him whatsoever. I'll I'll put that in regular English. Demons and the devil have impeccable theology. They've got faith without works as well. They believe in one God, that Jesus is is God, that he's part of the Holy Trinity, that he's their judge, and they even believe that they're going to hell. They know all of those things. And we have a great illustration of this in Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 36, when Jesus casts a legion of demons into the pigs on the hillside of Gadara, which we will see on our trip to Israel next March. But to be clear, believing correct doctrine alone isn't enough. Without love and the accompanying good works that are the natural output of saving faith, we are no better than these demons. The demons tremble in those verses in Luke 8, But many Christians aren't trembling, and I say Christians with quote marks, aren't trembling at all as they commit wickedness and sin. This is, this is very, very, very clear for us. And and it will cause us to, to examine ourselves. And so, I'll, I'll add on just a little bit more. The prophet Jeremiah said in two, uh, Jeremiah 2.19, Your own wickedness shall correct you. Know therefore that it is an evil and wicked thing that the fear of God is not in you. And it's that healthy fear of the Lord that should be present in a Christian. I I stand up here and I and I tell you this rather tough message but I want you to know with great great love that my desire is for every one of us to see this clearly and for there to be a difference in our walk Many of us have unsaved friends and family or even friends and family that are deceived and, and, you know, claim Christianity, but walk in this manner. And, uh, and I'm, I'm right there with you. And these things scare, scare me for them. And so. We will we'll pray about that at the end. In verses 20 through 25, James gives us two examples from Jewish history, Abraham and Rahab, 
and we can read about their faith at work uh, in, in several places in the Bible. For Abraham, if you're taking notes, Genesis 22, verse 12, um, Hebrews 11, verses 8 and 17 cover that ground quite well. Um, in Rahab's case, we have Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, uh, chapter 6, verses 17 through 25, and also Hebrews 11, verse 31. That's the, the hall of faith. You couldn't find two more different people. Abraham was a Jew. Rahab was a Gentile. Abraham was a godly man, and Rahab was a prostitute. Abraham was the friend of God, while Rahab belonged to the enemies of God. And yet each of them found favor in God's sight through their faith. And each demonstrated their faith to be real and genuine through their actions. And so with that said, we come to the tough verse, verse 24. A man is justified by works and not faith alone. So this statement seems to contradict Paul's teachings a little bit. And I will read from Romans 3, verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. That's pretty clear. Right? There's no contradiction, however, when you realize that Paul was specifically dealing with those who believed that obedience to the Old Testament laws could save you. While James is dealing specifically with those who believe you can claim to be a Christian and yet have no evidence in your life. It's two different discussions entirely. Jesus said in Luke 6.46, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? That is the driving focus behind James's teaching here. So continuing in verse 26, faith without works is dead. Again, we must remember the difference between Paul's teachings on faith and James's. Paul was describing in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, a living faith. And James here is talking about a dead faith. It's, a, it's an artificial uh, fool's faith that can often be mistaken for the real thing. A true saving faith looks to Jesus alone for salvation and then acts like it believes. So, how do I know if my faith is real and living? Luckily, the Bible has guidance in every scenario. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Paul says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. I like instructions. <laughs> I'm the guy who does read the manual when the Christmas box is opened and there's a lot of Stuff in there to put together. Um, so, do I claim to be saved but still continue in disobedience? Am I still doing evil things? Am I still sleeping with my girlfriend? Am I still stealing or cheating at work by lying on expense reports or taking home the company tools? Am I a bad steward with the blessings and resources God has blessed me with? Not using those things, my home, my salary, the time that I have in a day, to bless him and those that he's placed around me. Basically, am I still living the same way that I was before I got saved? I'm going to give all of us some challenging personal questions that we used in our Koinonia groups uh, the past weekend while going through these verses. Um, if you want to take a picture of that slide, actually, I'd, I'd, 
I'd like you to take a picture of this slide and chew over these questions on your own. Um, that's a heavy duty set of questions. I won't read them all out loud, but truly, uh, You know what, I'm not gonna read them. You guys, read them, read them, digest them, and be honest with yourself. I'll just read the last one. Am I ready for the Lord's return? Or will I be ashamed when he comes for me? Well, even though we have focused on the importance of works this morning, it is vital to remember that true Christianity is all about Jesus and the work of Christ for us, not our work for him. And uh, to remind us of that, uh, I, have, I have what I consider a treasure. Um, this is a book called The Valley of Vision, and it's a, a compilation of Puritan prayers from the 16th and 1600s and 1700s. And uh, I'm going to read, um, it's, a, it's a prayer called Christ Alone uh, by an unknown author. O oh God, thy main plan and the end of thy will is to make Christ glorious and beloved in heaven, where he is now ascended, where one day all the elect will behold his glory and love and glorify him forever. Though here I love him but little, may this be my portion at last. In this world, thou hast given me a beginning. One day, it will be perfected in the realm above. Thou hast helped me to see and know Christ, though obscurely, to take him, receive him, to possess him, love him, to bless him in my heart, mouth, and life. Let me study and stand for discipline in all the ways of worship, out of love for Christ and to show my thankfulness to seek and know his will from love to hold it in love and daily to care for and keep this state of heart thou hast led me to place all my nature and happiness in oneness with Christ in having heart and mind centered only on him in being like him in communicating good to others. This is my heaven on earth. But I need the force, energy, and impulses of thy spirit to carry me on the way to Jerusalem. Here it is my duty to be as Christ in this world, to do what he would do, to live as he would live, to walk in love and meekness. Then would he be known, and then would I have peace in death. You can hear the, the total commitment in this person's heart. And uh, knowing the tremendous struggle that they went through just to survive in Europe, then to make that insane voyage in the bottom of a ship to the United States, which was not even anything at the time, to carve out a spot in the wilderness and hanging on to Jesus for dear life. And 
surely there were moments of frustration. Surely there were times when a thumb was hit with a hammer. And yet, this is the focus. And this was the fuel that carried them through. And this was the foundation of our nation. Prayers like this. So, I have lots more on this topic, but I felt like this was a good place to stop. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your blessings, Lord. Thank you for loving us, even when we have been disobedient. Lord, help us to live fully the way that you want us to. Help us to be a good example. Help us to be your ambassadors. Father, the things that are within us that still don't belong, we ask that you pull them out, remove them, put them to death. And lastly, Lord, we lift up our pastor. Help him. Help him to be healed swiftly, Lord. We miss our shepherd. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.